my name's Paul Webley. I'm the director of SOAS. Welcome to SOAS. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see so many of you here this evening for the formal launch of the SOAS China Institute and our new lecture series, the first being tonight's panel discussion entitled China the Landscape. And now this SOAS China Institute lecture theatres will present original and valuable perspectives on China that will cut across business, media, government and academia. Now, SOAS has a long history of studying China and through the SOAS China Institute our aim is to frankly, to reclaim our world-leading position as a preeminent international centre for the study of China. And SARS is already known as the place to go to for those who really want to understand China outside of the traditional world-worn ruts. Where do the China students uh, of UCL, King's, LSC and others come for their Chinese language training and to use the extensive Chinese library resources? SOAS. You'll forgive this sort of aggressive marketing speak here. <laughs> Where is the home of the China Quarterly, which is the leading source for the serious scholarship of contemporary China and Taiwan, one of the most cited area studies journals in the world? SOAS. Where can you find nearly 50? I'm hoping, Michelle, that soon I'm not going to say nearly 50, but 50 but nearly 50 China experts all working together with expertise on subjects as diverse as Chinese film, Chinese archaeology, Chinese economics, Chinese music, international ma management practices in China. You name it, we do it. And you know what the answer is because I've already given you the answer twice. The answer is SOAS. As you may know, SOAS is approaching a major landmark in 2016, our centenary year. And we're approaching this year with clear purpose, renewed vigour and deep belief in our mission to build our expertise and our responsibility to share our institution's knowledge. Uh, the confidence that SOAS has is buoyed by recent generous donations. So some of you will have seen that last autumn we received a £20 million donation from the Alfred Wood Foundation for Southeast Asian Arts. And it's donations like that one that highlight the high-impact international cross-sector partnerships that we're developing. And if I look across the room and the people I was talking to earlier, our panel tonight, I see individuals from government, from arts organisations, from media, NGOs, business, academia, indeed from just about everywhere. And at SAS, we know that the academic voice is important, but we also know that this is not the lone voice as expertise in today's world. Only by working together with other academic institutions, with companies, with governments, with NGOs, with the media, can we impact on important global conversations. And that's my hope for the China Institute, that this will project SOAS and our expertise into the world, but will also make a real contribution to those important conversations that are going on. Now, I know that we'll produce world-class graduates through our new two-year advanced Masters in Chinese Studies, I also know that we'll publish world-changing research in our diverse and important interdisciplinary areas. We do that already. But to make a real difference, we need to build these world-changing partnerships that will help the world to truly under China, understand China in all its complexity and support China to walk a path that benefits the whole of mankind. And SOAS has a key role to play here. We have the different perspectives and a real knowledge that is grounded in decades of first-hand China experience. We have very clear ideas about what SOAS's role will be. But we also want to develop partnerships across the sectors to discover new ways forward. We look forward to having those conversations with all of you in the forthcoming months. And I just want to now introduce the founding director of SOAS China Institute and the most recent of a very long line of distinguished professors of Chinese at SOAS, Michelle Hawkes, at the end there. Michelle is, of course, as many of us know, a brilliant scholar. He's carried out groundbreaking research in contemporary Chinese internet culture. His book, which I strongly recommend on this, is coming out this year. That's a bit of advertising again. On modern Chinese poetry, on the sociology of modern Chinese literature. He's also a brilliant organiser and a brilliant leader. That's why his colleagues elected him the president of the British Association for Chinese Studies. And his interests in China are broad and deep, and he's passionate about sharing his insights with the world. That's why I'm so confident that Michelle is the best person to lead the SOAS China Institute. And that's enough about Michelle, I think. But Michelle, <laughs> he'll be asking for a rise next. <laughs> Over to you, Michelle.
and that's what he calls aggressive. Right? <laughs> Director Webley, Minister Councillor Shen, honored guests, esteemed colleagues, dear students. Welcome to the official launch of the SOAS China Institute. Today, the largest community of scholars of China in Europe joins the global conversation with and about China. We are confident we can make significant contributions based on our unique assets. Coverage of an unrivaled spectrum of specialisms ranging across the humanities and social sciences from the earliest times to the present and grounded, as is the SOAS tradition, in a thorough knowledge of language. Language. Zunjingdan 能帮我们做出非凡的贡献。我们的专业范围涉及到人文科学和社会科学的各个领域，包括从古典到现在的各个历史时期，并扎根于近两踏实的语言训练。这就是亚非学院的传统。I'm glad I got that bit out of the way. Now I continue. So that was language. <laughs> research, the eight research areas we will develop and that are described in the folders and leaflets that you will find uh, all around here, are all thoroughly interdisciplinary. When it comes to research, we believe that complex questions deserve complex answers and that these answers require collaborative cross-sector partnerships. The big questions facing China are global questions. At SOAS, we have some of the answers, and we know we can find some of the other answers with support and with partners. SOAS is renowned for taking a critical view of the world and looking outside of the traditional ruts that the China conversations inevitably find themselves in elsewhere, whether focused on corruptions, ideological oppositions, or the economic development versus human rights nexus. Through the SOAS China Institute, nearly 50 soon to be 50, academic experts are committed to distilling these answers and to transmitting them beyond our university walls, either independently or with the help of partners within or interested in the greater China region. Our new postgraduate teaching programs include our brand new two-year advanced masters in Chinese studies and are built on this same vision, to train a cadre of highly skilled individuals whose knowledge of China reaches beyond single disciplines and who are confident of working to the highest standards in a bilingual environment. This is what the best employers want from their future staff, globally minded, critical thinkers. In addition, we look forward to providing a suite of shorter courses, including our 2014 summer school, as well as bespoke training options. But we are not just a teaching institution SOAS is also a learning institution. We are profoundly aware of the fact that in today's world, expertise on China is by no means the sole property of academics. And I mean that. China experts are in the worlds of business, government, media, NGOs, and so on. As I said at the beginning, we are here to join the conversation, and we hope to provide a platform where boundaries can be crossed and bridges can be built. And on that platform today, at this inaugural event in the SOAS China Institute Lecture Series, are four eminent individuals whose professional expertise epitomizes the range of knowledge and experience on China that I described just now. It is my distinct honor to introduce them to you. Rosemary Foote, is Professor of International Relations at Oxford. She is also a SOAS alumna, and we welcome her back into our midst. Within the academic world, Rosemary has been a pioneering bridge builder, 
Her latest book, called China Across the Divide, aims to bring together debates about China's domestic policy and society, as well as its role in international politics. Stephen Lilly is Director for Asia Pacific at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. He is a Mandarin speaker who has worked as a diplomat in Beijing, Guangzhou, and Hong Kong. His experiences in New Delhi and as the UK ambassador to the Philippines have given him an Asian-wide perspective on China. Simon Roby is one of this country's leading investment bankers. In his very impressive career, he has held a wide range of senior management positions, dealing with China in many of them. Most recently, he has become chairman of Atlas Capital Group, which specializes in the Chinese market. Simon's expertise crosses over into the realm of culture, where he holds a number of positions, including chairman of the Royal Opera House. Wen Guangxiao is managing director of the European operation of the Phoenix Media Network, the largest worldwide Chinese language news and entertainment provider. Educated in China, the USA, and the UK, and having worked as a diplomat at the UN, as well as as a university lecturer, and now being active in the media, he epitomizes the kind of crossing of boundaries that we are trying to bring about here. Through his position at Phoenix, he has a unique vantage point on the often heated exchanges about the representation of China in the media. For this first public SCI lecture event, you might call it our calling card, each speaker has been asked to talk for 10 minutes about the landscape they are confronted with in their personal and professional interactions with China. And for those of you who are worried about tubes, we will stick to that time of 10 minutes per speaker. After the presentations, we will also make some time for discussion, including questions that have been sent in through our website. Before we start, a word of thanks. To the Lee Foundation of Singapore, especially Dr. Seng T. Lee, for providing us with a startup donation that has helped us on our way. To SOAS, for believing in the future of Chinese studies and entrusting their resources to me as the founding director of the SOAS China Institute. To my colleagues working in Chinese studies across all of our departments and disciplines for their support, their enthusiasm, and their commitment to achieving our vision. <coughs> and to all of you for being here tonight in such great numbers, making it all so very worthwhile. Thank you very much. And now I should like to invite Rosemary Foote to start. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. It is a great pleasure to be uh, back here at SOAS. As Michelle said, I'm a so as alumna, I took a MA here in Area Studies so long ago that it was actually called MA Area Studies Far East. We, we, we wouldn't call it that now. And um, um, one of the um, fond memories I have is that I, I wrote an MA thesis on Sino-Soviet relations. And although he probably won't remember it, uh, John Gittings actually provided useful supervision at a crucial moment when I was developing uh, that thesis topic. So it's a great pleasure to be back here and to see John in the audience. Um, it's, uh, I want to think about the um, issue of landscape in two particular ways. First, in a very literal sense, and to think about uh, landscape in geographical, geopolitical terms, and then to think about landscape and its relationship to the world of ideas and the world of scholarship and I hope in those ways to make connections with my fellow panelists here. Now, when I first began the study of China and its international relations, it really wasn't that. It was about Chinese foreign policy. Um, it was a study of Maoist China. We focused on the country as a rather weak country. Um, we thought about it as a land power. Uh, we thought about it as a country contained by the strongest state in the international system, that is the United States, contained strategically, economically, politically. And uh, we wrote about a focus on um, China's relations with the dominant superpowers of the day, the former Soviet Union and the United States. 
I wrote about um, the fact of China not really having a fully developed policy towards its neighbors in the Asia Pacific. It tended to think about its relations with its neighbors through this lens of Sino-Soviet relations. So a particular geographical um, take on the world, um, which was unusual in, in many ways. The big strategic changes came in the 1970s, of course, when China entered the United Nations and then, of course, with the rapprochement with the US. And so you get a changing um, dynamic between China and its own region in the sense that instead of the Asia Pacific region see, being seen as a hostile American lake, um, for a period at least, it was seen as um, an arena which could provide China with a degree of protection. Again, protection against its, its northern um, border and against the former Soviet Union. And perhaps it was also seen as a way the U.S. relationship with Japan in particular was seen as a way of um, putting constraints on what has been a long-term ter concern in China about the potential rise of Japanese militarism. So a very different uh, uh, relationship with the United States in that period. Perhaps, though, the most dynamic and most um, momentous decisions are the ones associated with the reform and opening in late 1970s. And this is the era when we begin to think about China's economic and political resurgence. And we begin to think about China as becoming a major global actor in, in, in world politics. Now that resurgence has been fueled by an export-led strategy, which uh, has changed China's geographical understanding of, its, of itself in the sense that the sea routes, the sea borders have become much more significant to it. So once we thought of it predominantly as a land power concerned about its internal border regions, now we think about it as a seagoing power design, desiring to protect those sea routes that provide um, the avenues for its, its goods to travel abroad but also to receive the resources that are so necessary for powering its economy. Um, China's resurgence has also led it to have more of the attributes of a great power, a, a global power with interests in all major c uh, continents of the world. And so its neighbours now experience it in a very different way. They think of it as a country to be socialised or to be constrained. They recognise it as a very important source of their continuing prosperity and they realize that in, it has the capacity to shape their futures for good or for ill. And so we, if we study China now, we know that it we have to have a far greater geographical reach. Um, and a central question has emerged out of this, especially in the West, and that is the question of what does China want in terms of global politics? Is it setting out to reform the global system to overturn it, or is it something in between of that? And when Chinese elites think about their futures. They think about, for example, 2021 and the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Chinese Communist Party. They think about 2049, the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of, of China. Where do they want China to be at that moment? Do they still see themselves as a middle-income country? Do they see themselves as the hegemonic power in the Asia-Pacific region? Or do they see themselves as a deeply interconnected country in a globalized system? And this leads me into my second perspective. And this is an alternative way about, of thinking about China and landscape. Um, so we're now fascinated with China as this powerful actor in the system that whether it likes it or not has major intended and unintended consequences. Its global imprint is huge. Um, it's in then, it's in a sort of mutually constitutive relationship with the global society. And instead of thinking about China's relations with other states, we now think about China's inter-societal relationships, and that means that this panel um, represents in so many ways those inter-societal relationships, relationships with uh, cultural bodies, with educational bodies, with um, um, uh, the business sector, with the financial sector, and so on. So we think about China not just through this lens of relations with major states, but, but also in terms of really important non-state civil society sectors. Two changes, I think, have occurred as a result of this 
move in the mode of studying China. And that is it's extraordinarily difficult to become a specialist on contemporary China, on China and the world. And this is partly the consequence of the numbers of issues that have arisen that are requiring collective action, whether that's climate change or nuclear non-proliferation and the like. And it's also the fact of China's presence, as I said earlier, in all major continents of the world. Um, so it's not sufficient to know something about China and the US or China and, and climate change. We need various interactions so that we actually generalize across a whole range of topic areas. We need to be able to, to recognize that we're perhaps focusing, specializing in a part of a very complex whole. And therefore, again, the interconnections that the SOAS China Institute is trying to establish and develop are so very important so that we don't get fixated on our own particular specialist study with respect to China, but, but begin to understand how we can generalize across various forms of behavior. Another significant outcome in this changing world of which China is such an uh, important part is that the country has become a, a subject of study not just for the China specialists, but for those in disciplines where China becomes a case study in many ways. So for example, in my own field, international relations, IR theorists, uh, perhaps a realist among them, would be focused on what does it mean for global order? What does it mean for peace and war? Uh, of the, the, uh, the fact that China has increased in power relative to the United States. How does that change the system which we are a, a part? Or if, for example, you are interested in the more sociological approaches to international relations, if you think of China as an unusual entity in global politics in that it has an identity as both a developing country as well as a great power identity, how does that influence the way we've thought about identity politics as a subject of study within the field of international relations? One could expand this if you're interested in the global energy market, if you're interested in the art market, if in, in culture more broadly, if you're in, interested in the environment, then again, China becomes a very important case study for you um, to focus on. So in order to deal with this um, greater complexity, the SOAS China Institute, as you can see, has, is, is developing a number of different research areas that require interdisciplinary expertise, and I congratulate them for that. And I would say that this is important for three main reasons, and I'll end on this point. It overcomes this danger that I spoke of earlier of specializing in simply one slice of China's international relations, and it allows us to generalize um, away from our specialist focus when we need to be able to do that. Secondly, it avoids the pitfalls associated with the perception of China as a unique actor in world politics, because I think we sometimes can get carried away for, for uh, in some senses, understandable reasons. And thirdly, the SOAS China Institute promises to deepen our understanding of this complex entity that we call China, but which is clearly not a singular phenomenon. So thank you very much. I pass to my colleagues. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. And you know, I think you've, you've added a very significant question to the questions that are being raised here in terms of what does China want and also what do we want from China and you know, how does that relationship develop? And I think Stephen might well be yes. the perfect person to talk more about that. And do, do feel happy to comment and, and on things said by other speakers mm. in your presentation. Thank you. No, well, I mean, certainly many of the questions that uh, Rosemary has raised are exactly the sort of questions that we're uh, thinking about in the Foreign Office, and I'll come back to that. Let me begin, first of all, by congratulating SOAS on the launch of the SOAS China Institute. It's a, it is a very special occasion. It has a particular resonance for me. It's 25 years ago since I came to SOAS to... Uh, do foreign office language training um, as a young diplomat. I'm never quite sure whether SOAS considers foreign office language trainees to be alumni, but um, <laughs> <coughs> and I, uh, but anyway, I shan't, um, uh, I, I shan't uh, uh, embarrass my teachers seeing former, uh, my 
former teacher, Professor Hugh Baker, in the audience, I shan't emulate your uh, feat of beginning in Chinese, um, Michelle. Um, but I do think this is a very important occasion, and the idea of building up a center of, of real, deep, and multidisciplinary expertise in China, in London, is something that is really important, and something that in the Foreign Office uh, we really value. China, no country, is going to have a bigger impact on our lives in the 21st century than China, and it's critical, therefore, that we uh, have a deep and wide understanding of those impacts. As a policymaker, looking back over the past 25 years, since we're talking about landscapes, what strikes me in a way is how much the Chinese landscape has broadened out for us as policymakers and how the landscape of UK China relations has broadened out in scope, in depth, and in complexity. I first went to China as a diplomat in 1992, and at that time, the UK-China landscape was framed overwhelmingly, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly um, by Hong Kong and by the ongoing uh, negotiations between Britain and China at that time over the future of Hong Kong. And so much of what we did was seen through that prism. I was not personally dealing with Hong Kong most of the time. I was there... Um, in the days when we had sort of 75% of one person focusing on the Chinese economy because that was about as much as it required. Uh, so that was me. Uh, I arrived in China on the week of uh, Deng Xiaoping's southern tour and the period that followed that I still think is one of the most exciting and significant periods uh, in China's uh, economic history and the process of its reforms. But even then, we had a tendency, I think, to see the Chinese economy as something a bit like Chinese politics and Chinese literature and Chinese history. It was something rather rather special. And it was something, uh, the point that, that Rosemary made, it was something that was very much for China specialists and that mo most of the time, as long as we reported it back to the Foreign Office, um, uh, most of British government really didn't worry too much about what was going on in China, in the economy, and in politics. And, and the contrast today could not be greater. Um, today, our relations operate on a broad canvas that reflects the huge developments that have taken place in China and that reflect China's, what is now China's central role in world affairs, in the economy, but also in global politics. Now we have, to illustrate that, we have a well-developed architecture now in UK-China relations. This has sometimes been obscured sometimes by political differences, but the reality is that uh, we have annual summits between the British Prime Minister and the, Brit and the Chinese Premier. We have three cabinet-level dialogues between Britain and China and a host of other official-level dialogues and exchanges, including an annual Joint Economic and Trade Commission. It is worth highlighting some of the content of these exchanges to illustrate the breadth of our relationship. So last October we had our annual economic and financial dialogue, which is led by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, together with Chinese Vice Premier Ma Kai. That took place in Beijing. At the center of that was our ongoing collaboration uh, in the financial se services sector, and particularly the, international of the, the interna internationalization of the renminbi and the development of London as an international trading center for the renminbi. And 25 years ago, who would have thought that we would be talking about the renminbi as an international currency? During that dialogue, we also opened the door to Chinese investment in the British civil nuclear program. We announced millions of pounds of Chinese inward, inward investment into the UK, including an expansion in Huawei's R&D uh, operations in the UK. Now again, 25 years ago, um, who would have thought of Chinese investment in the UK, uh, still less Chinese investment in high technology 
by what is more or less a private company. So a great deal has changed. In February, we had our strategic dialogue between the Foreign Secretary, William Haig, and State Councillor Yang Jiechi. That took place in London. Um, that, of course, followed the Prime Minister's um, big business delegation to Beijing in December. But at the strategic dialogue, we discussed a whole range of issues of the day, Syria, Ukraine, Iran, North Korea, we discussed big global challenges, climate change, counter-proliferation, the development of cyberspace. Well, 25 years ago, of course, there wasn't really any cyberspace to talk about. But also, 25 years ago, the idea that we would be engaging with China uh, to discuss the solutions to global problems uh, was still a very undeveloped idea. And then last week, we held in China our people-to-people -people dialogue, as we call it. Now, um, it's not, well, ministers are people, so it is a people-to-people uh, pe -people dialogue in that sense. It's not a people-to-people -people dialogue in the sense of uh, civil society. It's led by the health secretary, um, Jeremy Hunt, and by Vice Premier Liu Yendong. It includes, on our side, the university's minister, David Willits, the minister for culture, communications, and creative industries, Ed Vasey, and they went to China to talk about a whole range of issues around innovation, education, healthcare. So Jeremy Hunt was talking about how to help China build its healthcare system, about the opportunities for the NHS and for British healthcare companies to be part of that. But we talked about the really big health challenges of the 21st century facing the whole globe, the challenge of dementia, of antimicrobial resistance. During the same visit, we signed a UK-China film co-production treaty. We signed an agreement between the UK National Theatre and the National Theatre of China to produce a Chinese version of War Horse in 2015. And we signed an agreement uh, for the Department of Education, I find this slightly scary myself, but um, on maths teaching exchanges to, uh, to improve the quality of maths teaching in UK schools. So this is a varied, and it's quite an eclectic set of examples, but I give them because I think they illustrate that 21st century engagement with China is, is as Rosemary said, it's truly multidisciplinary. And it also reflects the fact that there are few issues, if any, in the world that don't have a Chinese dimension. And therefore, if we don't understand the Chinese dimension, the Chinese perspective and the Chinese interest in these matters, then our understanding of them will be incomplete. And that makes it all the more important to have centers of interdisciplinary expertise on China to look at this full range of issues. Now, when I was first uh, thinking about what I would say tonight and to talk about the landscape, I thought I had better check the dictionary definition and uh, the Oxford Dictionary definition is, uh, of landscape is all the visible features of an area of land. I suppose for a, for, for a foreign policy maker in particular, it's not just the visible features. Um, it's in a sense the invisible features or at least the unknown or the uncertain things that preoccupy us in particular. And the fact is that with China, uh, there are still a lot of unknowns or uncertainties. But these are issues that matter for policymakers, and they matter for Britain, and they matter for Europe. And Rosemary raised some of those questions, um, which overlap with the ones that I, that I would offer now, which is, indeed, what kind of role will China exercise in the rules-based international system, uh, politically, but in particular for trade and investment? How will China exercise its growing military capability? Particularly, how will it exercise that within its own region? How will China address the expectations of its population with regards to human rights and fundamental freedoms? What role will it play in shaping international norms for the development and use of cyberspace? And to say nothing about how China will 
tackle not only global issues, but its own domestic issues, the issues that are uh, uh, the subject of media debate in China, about inequality, about the rural-urban divide, about food safety, about water safety, water scarcity, resource scarcity, air quality. These are issues that preoccupy above all China, but they preoccupy us, they should preoccupy us, because the solutions to these will determine China's success in terms of economic and social development. And let's be clear, from the perspective of the British government, we want to see China's success uh, in these areas. And fundamentally, they will determine really whether the, not just China's success, but then the success of Asia, and therefore the uh, future of what many call the Asian century. Now, I come back to SOAS to conclude. I've said it's important that we have a center of real China expertise in the UK. I think it is very important that that expertise doesn't remain only in SOAS, uh, that it comes out, as you're wanting to do, to uh, share with a wider society. Um, because if Britain is to fully unlock the opportunities of China and the rise of China, and if we're to respond to the challenges which go with that, then we need to have a much wider understanding, not just in our universities, but across government, across business, across media, in education, and in society as a whole. And we need a much more vibrant debate between these sectors, which is exactly what we're trying to do here tonight. The uh, former Australian Prime Minister, Julian, uh, Julia Gillard, she spoke of making Australia more Asia-literate and more Asia-capable. And I also think we need Britain to be more Asia-literate and more Asia-capable. And at the heart of that, we need Britain to be more China-literate and more China-capable. And if there is one thing that SCI can really do, it is helping us achieve that. Thank you. My heartfelt thanks go to our distinguished alumnus. If any other members of the panel have SOAS connections that I'm unaware of, please feel free to share them. Um, if not, then uh, let's move on. Uh, Simon Roby. Uh, I am not an alumni of <laughs> SOAS. Um, my uh, most distinguished uh, foreign language achievement was passing my French O-level on the fifth attempt. <laughs> Um, uh, I do, uh, though, in all seriousness, join my fellow panellists in congratulating you for, for this evening and for the work you're going to do. I think it is profoundly important, and I'm going to try in a few minutes to bring to life for you why wearing the various hats I wear is profoundly important. Um, I wear a number of hats, um, and the most obviously relevant is my new chairmanship of Atlas Capital, um, but I also um, had a long career uh, at Morgan Stanley where I ran uh, our global M&A franchise and ran our a firm in the UK. Um, and I now have my own um, advisory firm, which um, I'm pleased to say has uh, some very large clients, uh, each of whom inevitably have important interests in China. I won't name them all, but uh, you'll get a sense of it when I say they include Rio Tinto, BP, RBS, Vodafone, and so on. Um, I'm also uh, chairman of the Royal Opera House, and I'm always really pleased to be badged primarily as chairman of the Royal Opera House as opposed to an investment banker. So, um, and uh, I think, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that the Royal Opera House was really at the vanguard of structuring concrete relationships with Chinese cultural institutions. We, we took the Royal Ballet to Beijing prior to the Beijing Olympics which was uh, a very wonderful experience for all of us, but was the beginnings of a, of a real partnership with the National Center for Performing Arts in Beijing with exchange of uh, backstage staff in particular so that we could transfer skills. So China, China surrounds me uh, and is relevant to every day of my life. Here's, here's, a, uh, here's a today example of that. Um, I am advising AstraZeneca, um, who today 
as you, uh, those of you who follow these things will have seen, uh, have got embroiled in a situation with Pfizer, um, who are seeing whether they can put, a, put an offer to buy AstraZeneca on the table. Um, we, uh, we got wind of this initiative only on Saturday, uh, this iteration of the initiative anyway, only on Saturday. So it's been a, a busy uh, couple of days um, and a very busy day today. And you could imagine that uh, on the first day of the publicity of something as significant, this is a $100 billion uh, potential bid, possibly much higher than a $100 billion potential bid for one of our most important British companies, that there would be a host of issues that would preoccupy somebody like me, who's their key board advisor, on a day like today. Um, but we got to China during today. So when we'd finished worrying about what to say to the UK government, what to say to the Swedish government, what to say to the U US government, what to say to our shareholders, what to say to our board, what to say to our employees, China featured um, in, in, a, in a potential transaction between a very large US pharmaceutical company and a very large UK pharmaceutical com company. Why? Because it so happens that they are the first and second biggest foreign pharmaceutical companies in China, uh, and Mofcom will have a point of view about, about the uh, transaction. If this was happening five years ago, we would not have got to the Chinese regulatory issues possibly at all, and certainly not in the first several days of the slightly kind of hectic uh, evaluation of all the various issues. But, but the Mofcom uh, reaction to the potential combination of these two major companies featured in the very first day of uh, consideration of, uh, of this potential but highly tentative idea. An extraordinary change in my working life and of course one which means that somebody like me trying to help uh, companies practically navigate their way through complicated situations must understand this extraordinary place much better than I do. Principally the motivation why I've decided to invest more of my time in China by taking over the chairmanship of Atlas Capital. Um, I thought, again I'm looking at the clock, I thought that what I could most usefully uh, try to explain to you was um, some of the issues that tend to dog discussions in this country about possible investment from China into this country. And I think um, that conversation ought to be easier in this country than any other country in the world, probably, given the very public openness that the current government has, has been careful to, to, to espouse, and as you've heard Stephen describe. And all of us who, who work in business in London understand that this government is committed to having a very open and permissive relationship with China economically and in terms of its relationships with our key companies. Um, and there are obvious reasons why major companies domiciled in the UK would want to have very important uh, relationships with uh, Chinese entities. Um, access to the Chinese market, obviously access to extraordinary amounts of uh, potential investment, obviously. Less obviously, but really importantly, as, um, as the world changes, the, uh, the extraordinary influence that China exerts in the markets and countries where it is particularly important is a very interesting asset for British companies to think about harnessing as they go about their business. How much more helpful is it to have a Chinese friend in Mongolia than to have, with all due respect to you, Stephen, the British government worrying about what you're doing in Mongolia. Um, that's probably the end of my British passport. Um, <laughs> so, so lots of reasons why it should be an absolute no-brainer to look to China first for your um, non-British and perhaps non-conventionally Western source of investment. Uh, and there are really interesting examples of Chinese, prominent Chinese investment in important UK public and non-public companies. The one that, that uh, startled me the most when it happened and I've got uh, the most familiar with is the investment into Rio Tinto, which happened, as I'm sure you all know, during the uh, hostile bid by BHP for Rio Tinto several years ago, um, where I was uh, deeply involved. 
So why, what, are, what are the problems? What are the issues? What preoccupies um, sensible groups of UK directors as they're thinking about, about this? I think in, in no particular order, there is, there is a sense of opaqueness about how decisions get made in China, about the connections between different state-owned entities, those state-owned entities and private entities, all of that and, and the government. How does it really work? How do decisions get taken? Um, how do the various um, uh, stakeholders in China um, coordinate, not coordinate, seek to intervene in a particular decision-making process? Very poor understanding about that. There is a worry, uh, candidly, about confidentiality, about when you introduce a Chinese um, in, uh, element into something, do you struggle to keep your secret secret? Um, and uh, I think that, um, that sits in the backs of lots of people's minds. There is a really important question about corporate governance. Does a Anglo-Saxon corporate governance model sit comfortably with non-Anglo-Saxon corporate governance models? How would it feel to have um, Chinese directors sitting around a board table in a London boardroom? How, how would that cramp discussion? How would that inform discussion? How would it actually work practically? Language, culture, different starting points in discussions. Might there be a risk that you'd have one board discussion with Chinese directors in the room and the real board discussion in a different place? That kind of dysfunctional governance stuff people are rather allergic to. How would it feel if you were the partners of a much, with a much, much more powerful company than you are yourself? Um, I had a wonderful colleague who used to say, when you dance with a gorilla, the gorilla decides when to stop. And, and, and there is a sense that um, if you're a very large UK company but your Chinese counterpart is 10 times larger, how do you keep some sense of control over the dynamic in a, in a partnership? So fundamentally, how, how, how would it feel to have a partnership, an open partnership, with a very important, very large but perhaps rather less well-known Chinese entity. There's also a, a big worry that people have, which is about how the owners of businesses in the UK would react to um, the, uh, the introduction of a very important uh, partnership with, with, uh, with a Chinese entity. And we've seen some mixed reactions over the years from deeply allergic, where there's a sense that a particular investment might skew a strategy in a way that might not be quote shareholder friendly in the UK to rather to rather welcoming in other situations. So given that there are such fundamentally good reasons for these partnerships to exist, our job, our job, this extraordinary initiative's job is to try to get a much more subtle understanding of what we're dealing with here so that some of the rather crude, rather monolithic assumptions about what it would be like to deal with Chinese entities and Chinese individuals are broken down. Some of the burden, I'm sure, lies in China for this, but a great deal of the burden lies in, in having a much more subtle understanding about what having partnerships with, uh, with companies in, in this extraordinarily important part of the world will really mean. So that is my hope for this, that, that we can get to a level of understanding which is much more subtle and of course, subtlety brings open-mindedness. Thank you very much indeed. I think we're getting wonderful insights into some very practical concerns that are present in these different sectors that are to do with China and the way the world is changing as a consequence of what's happening in China. So I think having them juxtaposed is really you know, for me, and I hope for all of you, uh, a wonderful experience. Uh, so we follow up now with our, with our final speaker, uh, Dr. Shao. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I also wish to join other uh, speakers, and members of the panel, in congratulating SOAS for the launch of the China Institute and also for the honor for me to speak here. Uh, I dare say I don't have any uh, formal connection with SOAS uh, in my past, but uh, when I did my DPhil at Oxford about 30 years ago, I used to come here to, uh, you know, dig deep into the library, and, uh, and I find 
and I found uh, Suez um, uh, very good holding of uh, of um, old papers of uh, of uh, British commercial houses um, uh, back in the uh, uh, 19th century and the first part of the 20th century in China and Shanghai and so on. So I used to spend time looking through the Swire papers and you know that sort of thing, um, and I and I did admire uh, Suez for the, for the tremendous uh, resources. And uh, that's why I come here today, um, not without trepidation, and, uh, and nor do I um, really um, think that I can say something that uh, uh, you don't know, uh, because you, you've been specializing in, the, in China studies. And uh, among the... Uh, uh, panel members, I'm probably the only uh, uh, person from inside China uh, looking at China rather than observing the landscapes and, uh, and um, uh, phenomena and the policy and the second guessing what's going on in the minds of the Chinese leaders from outside. So um, if I, I guess um, a lot of uh, um, Chinese sitting in the audience may laugh at me if um, the Chinese don't even know what's going on in China. <laughs> uh, um, so that's all the more reason for us to admire so as for launching the China Institute and trying to really um, uh, get grips with uh, what's going on in China. But I'd like to share uh, with you my um, personal observations about uh, the media landscape uh, in China um, one small aspect of, uh, of, of what's going on in the past 30 years in China. Um, as I represent a Phoenix television group, a Hong Kong company broadcasting into mainland China, and uh, in the process of doing that, having a lot of interaction with the regulatory bodies, with uh, fellow uh, TV and media organizations in China. And uh, uh, personally, I have observed uh, uh, what's going on and all the changes are happening um, in China uh, in the media sector. Um, but first of all, uh, a few words about um, uh, Phoenix Television. And I'd like to single out uh, a number of uh, differences in our way of doing things that may have made a difference in China's media landscape um, in the past 18 years since we launched the first flagship uh, channel, the Phoenix Chinese channel, in 1996. That probably was uh, uh, something very new, and uh, it gave birth to the dawn of a new era in TV news reporting in China. Uh, a lot of people were very surprised to see something so radically different from what they uh, were very familiar and very comfortable with official uh, television media like CCTV. Um, one is our news reporting is combined with live stand-in and, uh, and the studio commentaries. So quite a lot of layers of reporting on the same news and same event to give people interpretation and insights, etc. And we have programs named after the presenters. Uh, and uh, leading commentators like Lu Yu, like uh, all these people, Tiger, and, uh, and in the process of doing that, we have learned from Larry King Lai, from uh, Charlie Rose show, or from, say, uh, uh, Barbara Waters in America. Um, and people are uh, very familiar with the household names, but people in China hardly could remember the names of the TV presenters in, official television broadcast because their identity was that important, was not that important uh, as to the main role of, uh, of the party's uh, uh, policy announcements and uh, mouthpiece. Um, um, the second um, feature is that we have introduced live TV debates uh, on current affairs and, top and topical social issues with guest speakers live arguing over um, uh, controversial issues. And official TV programs 
uh, one could notice the difference immediately because they didn't do debates for obvious reasons. Um, and Phoenix also is known for his new perspectives in um, China's modern history and the world events. And we push the envelope with regard to controversial historical figures and introduce new insights and uh, new theories and uh, new assumptions about historical events and Chinese traditions and cultural legacy. So it's a huge challenge to the accepted narrative and uh, conventional wisdom. And uh, that really opened the eyes to people. And, and then in a break from the political tradition, uh, we focus on ordinary people and people at the lower echelons of the society, at the obscure corners of the society, very much away from the usual uh, role models of the government. And, and, uh, and then we tell uh, what's going on in every, everyday life of the real people in the real situation. Uh, that's also something uh, quite different uh, in, uh, in usual Chinese uh, media reporting. Now, we are very bold in discussing human values and religious beliefs and bottom line issues, uh, include, including social injustice and sexual discrimination, family violence, child abuse, environmental degradation, etc. cetera. So um, in a way, we are very uh, bold in, in uh, careful in stepping in, in the official line. But on the other hand, we keep telling ourselves um, not to be obsessed with negativity, as in the Western media, but to embrace hope and sunshine and um, uh, basic human decency. Um, so we tell ourselves to be fair and balanced uh, in our reporting. Now, it is clear uh, much has changed in China's media landscape. Reporters are changing from official note takers to critical watchdogs of public policies and social um, justice. And governmental bodies are developing a sense of media management uh, thanks to all the training and, uh, and, uh, and uh, regular uh, improvement and, and then public accountability with, uh, with uh, spokesmen at various levels of government uh, ready to answer all the queries from the public. Uh, that's quite new. Um, there is also an, an apparent relaxation of control over negative news as well as undefined official secrets. Also, there has been an explosion of media activities in China. Uh, one can uh, not help noticing uh, whenever one is in China. Um, so much uh, uh, digitalization of TV networks and uh, huge increases of uh, uh, users of social media. Um, and therefore, you, you see um, a much broadened landscape of uh, media in China uh, with not one voice, but with a cacophony of uh, various voices um, in the society. But then in an increasingly open market economy, um, that's something that one expects uh, to see happen because media are no longer exclusively at the beck and call of the government, um, but essentially also a very important um, uh, key sector for growth. So um, there is still a bit of control in the regulation, but then the recognition that media must also be allowed to operate according to the market and the commercial rules and make money as a business. So even though um, government may be in a position to uh, hold you know, these uh, uh, media organizations, they barrel and shut down the system overnight, but they, there is no incentive for them to do that, just as there is no incentive for the government to end um, uh, Chinese consumerism. Now, what are the challenges ahead? In China, the government is best the media to report on official daily routines and uh, to promote stability and support the leadership. Um, so by instinct, and there is nothing nasty or nothing sinister about it, officials tend to want broadcasters and publications to tell good stories about China. 
um, I noticed that part of your remit is to uh, study China's image and the imagination of itself and how the rest of the world is looking at China. And, and, and that's also something very dear uh, to the government um, and to the officials at various levels of government. Um, I try to make China look and sound better and try to uh, contribute to improving China's image internationally. Uh, it is seen as an important part of a campaign for what is called social, uh, for, for what is called um, soft power. Yeah. Um, and therefore, as a result, the Chinese media today are still t very much torn between serving the government objectives on the one hand and monitoring problems on the other hand. And media tend to push the envelope as they do anywhere else. So the gap and the conflict are always there. And again, on the side of the media, there is nothing sinister or nothing um, you know, with ulterior motives, etc. They just want to have proper investigative journalism, right? So, um, so there is a fine line between objectivity and the social responsibility between news and official secret. And uh, CCTV news, for instance, have little <coughs> choice in delivering government uh, lines when the chips are down. But overall, it may depend on one's point of view whether the glass is half empty or half full. And I see it, this is a dynamic process and things are evolving uh, as we speak. Now, let me end um, with uh, three points um, for future development. Um, one is that China still has a long way to go in putting its house in order uh, in terms of uh, media reform. Uh, we must have media legislation so that media organizations can go by the rule of law. While economic power is indispensable, a higher moral ground is essential in getting other countries to pay attention. Um, personally, I think that uh, understanding the differences um, by other countries can help, but for China to command trust and admiration is a different matter altogether. At the end of the day, we in China need a deeper social change over longer periods to cultivate cultural values hospitable to the rule of law, protection of minority interests, and transparency of governments. Um, two, as China's media continue to grow, they will need to introduce changes in line with international norms and the professional standards. There is a regu ready recognition on the part of official media uh, about the uh, built-in uh, structural problems that CCTV and others must change or lose their competitive edge and the audience. But again, uh, government-sponsored international broadcasts and publications are a natural extension of their domestic operations with more or less the same mentality, same skills, the same group of people, more or less, with same limitations. So I think um, there is a long way for Chinese media uh, to go before they can get China uh, fully connected and for Chinese media to be taken seriously internationally. Lastly, I think there must be a more active conversation between uh, China and the international media organizations. Chinese reporters and editors should engage with their Western counterparts in meaningful exchanges to learn about each other's way of doing things. International communication is not a one-way street. It's not an export of force, but it's a dialogue and it's a convergence of views. And here, of course, Phoenix Television is always ready to help whatever way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for this very valuable insider's perspective um, that adds a lot to the palette that we've uh, presented to you here. Now I see people are rushing to the tubes that are no more. Uh, and I'm therefore taking the executive decision, being the director, that we're not going to have questions, but we're going to move straight to the end of the proceedings so that you can either run for that tube or run for the food and the drinks. 
which are presented on two levels, one directly outside here and one upstairs. Uh, and do please spread out and do please be aware of the fact that most of the food is actually upstairs. <laughs> um, now as you, and I hope as many of you as possible can stay, and I hope that you will continue the conversation that we have started. What we're trying to do here, I think you've heard, is new, is meaningful, is significant, is perhaps daring and courageous, and we really, really want to take it forward with your help and with your participation. So please talk to us, and please, let's get into action. Anyone wearing one of these gold-colored badges is someone you can talk to to take this conversation forward. But before we do so, um, I, would, I believe that we have a small token of our appreciation for our four speakers, which is now, as I make this sentence longer and longer, <laughs> being taken towards the table um, and will be handed over amidst the sound of your applause. Thank you.